Okay. okay. Hello, everyone. I'm here and all the other people are here. Welcome everyone, everybody. Hi. Are you awake or not? Okay. 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 Hello, hello Sebastian. Nice to see you again. Yeah, Welcome to the Italian C++ meetup here in Modena. We have a bunch of people attending here and I think we have uh, at the moment three people live, but they are still coming. So today we are going to talk about cross-platform development in C++. Thanks a lot for this. And uh, I leave you, let's say I leave you the stage, but uh, as we as we know, we are going to do a round table first about experiences of the people here. So I leave you the yeah. stage for now, Sebastian. Thank you. Uh, so before I start with my talk, uh, who of you uh, has experience actually doing cross-platform programming and what were, Maybe, maybe you can share a bit. What were the, the challenges that you encountered and the, the, the problems that you, you, you had? Okay. One, two, three. Okay, me as well. Okay. Do, I, I, do you want me you to... Just in, in what, whichever order. Okay. <laughs> For me, uh, one of the biggest challenges is uh, the setup of the various tool chain, mm -hmm. uh, especially for mobile platform, maybe mm -hmm. is okay. uh, challenging. Um, oh, right. Then, as a cute developer, multi-platform is uh, is good. Mm -hmm. Nothing particular. Okay, so you have a big toolkit that solves a lot of the problems for you. Um, I used to develop uh, software for uh, Windows and Linux, and the main challenge for me was also the development tool chain, mm -hmm. and also uh, the API difference, because uh, I worked in the video conferencing industry. So, for example, networking is, uh, low level networking is quite different between the platforms, and mm -hmm. uh, so these were the, the main challenges. Yeah. As probably similar to other people, uh, mostly Windows and Linux for me, and uh, with CMake, and uh, the, the biggest challenge in my opinion is the package management and also the, in the interoperability across different uh, IDEs. Mm -hmm. Because usually I employ Visual Studio and it's a great tool with great integrations also uh, for Linux, but sometimes I don't have Visual Studio on my on my environment, so I have to do other other tricks. And also okay. a recent experience we are having with also Mattia is the dockerization. So we need to run our C++ into Docker containers for Linux and uh, this is another challenge we have. Because we have to, you know, to keep the the workflow consistent and easy enough for the other developer to, mm -hmm. to develop things. Right. So that, that's yeah. the, the biggest challenges for us. All right, interesting. Yeah, um, I will not talk about our tool chain at all. Uh, but our tool chain is, I can I can say a few words now. Our tool chain is special in so far as that we support exactly two platforms. It's just macOS and and Windows, and both of them have excellent IDEs. And those IDEs are not only IDEs, but they contain their own build system. Uh, you have MS Build on Windows, and then Xcon has its own internal build system. Um, and it was so important for us to understand what these build systems do. Like, how do we have we correctly configured our build so it updates an output file when we change an input file? So there's a lot of code generation going on, maybe, or we generate other input files. And we we tried, actually. We tried to move to, to CMake, but it turned out to be extremely complicated for reasons I don't really know, actually. I didn't do it. Um, and what we do instead, and what we've done really successfully for a long time, is that we have uh, two builds, two build systems configured. We have our IDEs configured. We have MS build lets you configure build rules that say, well, I have a file with that file ending, always compile it with that tool and put the output there. 
and we configure Xcode the same way. And we really just have a script that has gets a very short input in a syntax file and fills those two solutions with uh, the files that need to be compiled. And the one of the reasons I think why we didn't ever move to CMake or we didn't really see the point was that uh, our programming environment is completely predetermined. We have a single set of computer setups. I can tell you uh, where all the shared libraries and all the headers are stored. I can tell you which compiler version we are using, and there's only a single one on each platform. So there's really nothing where we need to configure every, anything for different platforms. I can tell you exactly what compiler flags I want to use, and they're completely different in both of these. So in the end, this big advantage of, let's say, CMake to say, well, I have my boost libraries configured somewhere else. I have five different compilers that I need to support on, on Unix systems but we don't have any of those problems. So in that case, our solution is probably doesn't translate well to a lot of other places, uh, but it's very, very simple for us. It's a 700 line Python script, maybe. Okay, so uh, that's that's what's my talk. <laughs> <laughs> I answered all your questions about tool chains. Now, and if you if yeah. you want, then I'll just uh, I'll just start my I'll just start my talk. Yeah, and, let, me, let me share your slides here. Yes. All right, I'll switch to my slides, and you can. Uh, one second. No. Okay. Is that? Do you see that full screen now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's fine. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay, it because it did well. do something yeah. different for me. All right. Uh, so my talk will be is split in 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 individual chapters, and you can always uh, well, I'll ask for questions at the end of each chapter. So you have some questions about something, we can we can just go back and uh, discuss it immediately. All right. Okay. So. I want to share the lessons that we at things that have learned when we started to port our software from Windows to macOS and now in a, in a very small degree to the web. So what's the what was the problem that we started with originally? We had been doing 12 years of development for Windows only when we decided to port our software for macOS. And in that time, we had written maybe about a million lines of C++ code. And you can imagine that we had just used Windows data types and Windows APIs everywhere in our code base because, well, we could. And that was something, obviously, that we had to, we had to clean up in some way. Now, what's important to know is that our product, uh, ThingSell, is an add-in which is dynamically loaded uh, in PowerPoint and Excel. And that has some important implications. It means that we are not in control of the main application. And unlike people who maybe do server development, uh, we are not in control of the computer either, of course. That means we have to be very flexible in some regards. For example, we always had to be very flexible um, regarding our rendering backend. So we wanted, we had to be able to render into anything that the host application would give us. So that could be views, that could be core animation layers on macOS, which are kinds of textures. Uh, it could be H windows or DirectX textures on, on Windows. We always needed a renderer that supported DirectX on Windows and OpenGL on macOS because we felt that was the technology that was best supported on each operating system. We don't share the main message loop, the main event loop that belongs to the host application. And we always wanted to support the same platform specific features that our host application supported. And we had to be very quick in doing so so that we could minimize the friction between using our application and the, the main application. Uh, that could mean little things. PowerPoint, for example, on macOS uh, supports the triple click, which the triple click on text selects an entire paragraph of text. So we had to support that as well. And it could mean bigger things uh, like PowerPoint and the entire Office suite on, on, on macOS runs in a sandbox environment. So our application runs Sandbox as well, of course, and we had to be able to live with that. So when we started porting our software, of course, we were looking for some cross-platform toolkit that would hide all the platform specifics 
from us or would just behave identically on the different platforms we supported. And my talk is largely about why this is so hard to get or why this actually cannot really cannot really exist in this in this generality. I will go over different challenges that we we faced and different solutions that we 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 found and that also try to show to what length we went to to find an elegant solution for us. Uh, the first problem I'll talk about is how do you find the right level of abstraction? Where do you put your own platform independent interfaces if you don't use some library? So what is the problem exactly? Well, we have our operating system at the, the low level, which maybe supplies some functionality that we need. But on the other extreme, we want to write some platform independent C++ that ideally, to, in a large degree, should, should compile on every operating system we support. Now, we need something in between. We need some layer that, that hides the platform-specific part from us. And the, the question is, how do we design that layer? Where do we put that layer? On, on which abstraction level? Now, there's no generic answer to that question, how do you design that? Because it very much depends on the semantics of your code. It depends on the problem you're trying to solve. I looked through our code base when I was writing this talk, and I was looking at the different solutions that we had found. And there were a couple of cases where the solution was very easy, and these have one thing in common. So one easy case was writing an interface for a rendering engine where you have two different backends on both two operating systems that then generate DirectX or OpenGL commands. And that was relatively easy because the input is always the same. The input is always just a list of uh, triangle coordinates and texture coordinates. And then you have some backend that reads those triangles and outputs it differently. Um, another easy case was uh, doing HTTP requests using the system APIs. We use the system APIs because in our, for our desktop users, often in business environments, we want to make absolutely sure that when we do an HTTP request to some website, it uses the proxy settings that the administrators have configured, et cetera. So these environments can be pretty, pretty special. And here again, the interface was super simple because it's essentially a function that takes some HTTP URL, maybe some arguments, and returns data, a string, maybe. So that's practically the entire interface. And the last example was starting a child process and then setting up the IO mechanism so you can talk to the child process using pipes or whatever. Uh, here, as before, the result is simply something you can write to, and it didn't matter what happened under the hood. So what all these three examples have in common is that there were cases where there's clearly defined data that goes in and clearly defined data that comes out. And whatever happens in between um, doesn't interest the programmer at all, practically. He just waits for the, for the result. Now, there are a lot of other cases where it gets more difficult to design a good interface. One such simple problem is how to rename a file. So what we have to do here is we interact more closely with the operating system. Uh, it's not such a clear case of data in, data out. Maybe we are holding the file, so we are kind of bound to the behavior of the operating system regarding files. And a lot of you have heard to maybe Windows and Linux, um, program for Windows and Linux, so you're probably aware that these can behave very differently on both platforms. So let's look at the ways we can rename a file on the operating systems we support. So on Windows, there's move file X, which takes the source file name and the target file name and a couple of flags some of which are very platform specific, but there is uh, the copy allowed flag, which tells move file X that copying the file would be allowed instead of moving when the source and target are in different volumes. And there is replace existing, which allows the function to override the target file if it already exists. By default, it wouldn't do so, it would return an error or some return code, an error action, yes. So on Linux and macOS, we have two different functions that are very similar function variants of the rename function. Um, and they take different flags. Uh, one of those rename swap would allow us to swap a source and target file atomically, but only on supported file systems. 
And the other one is like the opposite of move file X. It uh, tells rename to fail if the target file exists, but by default, it would override the target file. Okay, that seems useful and parts of it match to each other. And then on macOS, there's also the copy file API, which can also move files. And it has an entirely different set of flags. It allows us, for example, to specify if we want to copy the access control list from the source location to the target location. So that's a very valid question. Do we? Maybe we don't in some cases. The other functions didn't let us specify this. Uh, optionally, we can only copy the file's data. We can also fail if the file already exists. We've seen that before. And we can remove the source location. OK. So these are pretty different. They support even, even more different flags. So the question comes up, how do we write a platform independent interface that just allows us as C++ programmers to rename a file and it just works on all different platforms? Well, we have an answer to that. The standard gave us an answer to that. And it's the standard file system replace function, which does none of all the useful things we have just seen. It just takes a source, a target, it always overrides the target and is done with it. This is, to be fair, probably the only thing the standard could do because this is exactly what a POSIX system has to have, a rename function that always overrides the target location. But it's also a horrible least common denominator that I, in practice, find hardly useful at all. I cannot imagine, at least not in our desktop application environment where we have to share the computer with a lot of other programs that can do crazy things, I don't know how I could ever use that function. So how can we come up with something more useful, something more powerful as well, without cluttering our code uh, with if devs just to do something different on each operating system? Uh, it's obviously hard to get identical and useful low-level semantics on different platforms. But maybe this is the wrong question to ask. Maybe we don't actually need to have a cross-platform file rename function because that's the wrong level of abstraction. If we look in our code base, what it is that we actually try to do, then we are trying to solve completely different problems. Maybe we are trying to download a file to a local cache in some thread-safe way uh, so that no two processes can ever read a partially written cache file or override each other's results. Maybe we are trying to create a user-specific application settings file. Maybe we are trying to create a temporary file that will be automatically deleted, but which can be opened by another application in the meantime. Maybe we are trying to create a document in some user-specified folder so that the user should see uh, a safe file dialog, uh, the system should create a sandbox exception, et cetera. So we actually maybe maybe we need functions with very strong semantics. And if we define such functions, we can implement them identically on different operating systems. So we can, of course, implement them in different ways, but with identical semantics. So let's look at some examples here and the choices that we can make on different operating systems. So the simplest example was how to create a user application settings file on Windows. Maybe we want to put it in a Thingsil subfolder of app data. That already implies a choice because the app data folder is roaming. That means if your user profile is stored on a server, that Thingsil folder in app data will be copied to each client machine you log on to. That's a good choice. We want the user to have the same settings on each computer. On Windows, processes can run with different integrity level, even if they're running as the same user. And that could mean that if a process is run as uh, with a high integrity level first and it writes settings, then it's run with low integrity level later, it can't read the settings we have just written. So maybe we want to encode the integrity level in the folder name. On macOS, there are entirely different choices we have to make. By default, maybe we would store the file in library application support thing cell. Maybe our application is part of a group of sandbox application that should share the same settings file. Then it should go in a group container that uh, is private to our sandbox application group. And then there are a couple of decisions we can make just because we know uh, what the function is supposed to do. 
So we can, for example, always say that we want to lock the file with an exclusive lock when we're writing it, because we want nobody to read a partially written settings file. And we can also say that we always want to inherit the access control list from the parent folder when we create such a file, because the parent folder is a system folder and presumably has the correct access control list set. Now, a more complicated example is how to create a temporary file that will be automatically deleted for us, but which can be opened by another application. On Windows, that is pretty straightforward. We create a file in the temp folder by some name. Maybe we specify some Windows-specific security attributes. We want to prevent execution of the file. We want to make it accessible by the current user. And then there's this magic flag, file flag delete on close, which says pretty much exactly what we wanted to say. It means Windows will automatically delete the file when the last handle to that file is closed. But as long as that handle is open, anybody who has the same file path can open and, and read the file. So that's pretty useful, pretty useful guarantee that Windows gives us here. Now, what do we do on Mac OS or on other Unix systems? Well, maybe we open the file first. And again, there are some system-specific settings we have to uh, set. Uh, maybe we have to handle that the open can be interrupted by a signal and it can return e-interrupt, and then we have to retry the open. Um, well, then we can say, OK, how, to, how can we make sure that the file will be automatically deleted? Uh, we could implement our own reference counting, for example. Maybe we can reference count the file in some shared memory uh, data structure. That could work. Maybe we say, well, that's not robust enough for us. If one of the participating processes crashes, then he will not uh, decrement the reference count to a file, and we will never delete the file. So we can say, well, if we look at the semantic, oh, and because I framed the question the way it is, you cannot do the typical Unix trick to create a temporary file and delete it right away, because then another application cannot open it using the file. So we have to do something else. But we can say, well, all we need is a, create is a temporary file that somebody can write to. It doesn't actually have to be a file file. Maybe we can look at our problem and say, well, we could implement this in a totally different way. We could say, well, we could store our temporary data in a SQLite database and return something that simply behaves the same way a file behaves. And now we have a much smaller problem to clean up after ourselves, because now we only have a single database that we have to delete when we're done with it. Uh, we don't have to uh, manage uh, a thousand files that we are leaking on the computer. So that problem is much simpler suddenly. And it, the freedom, uh, it's, it's, we use the freedom that the, a strong function semantics gave us to choose a completely different uh, implementation here. So cross-platform interfaces always need to have such well-defined strong semantics. Otherwise, the implementers can't be quite sure what it is you expect, how a function should behave. So you start seeing warning signs, or it is a big warning sign, if you suddenly start looking into the implementation of something on one of the operating systems, because it's actually not clear what this function, what this thing should be doing on one of the operating systems. What exactly does it set, which flags, et cetera? So if you start doing that, then you've made a mistake somewhere else. On the other hand, if you choose strong functions that clearly define what they're supposed to do, then you increase the degrees of freedom for your implementer, typically that may be yourself. And as you've seen, you can choose completely different implementations that still do the same thing effectively. There are two mistakes we can make here. Uh, we can start introducing cross-platform interfaces at a too high abstraction level. And that might mean that we miss the chance to unify some code that would, in fact, have been identical on each operating system. This, in my experience, is extremely rare because we are super lazy as programmers. The opposite mistake is much more frequent, that you try to force uh, a cross-platform interface on some very low-level functionality. And then you end up forcing identical interfaces on very different things. And the result might be that the semantics don't match the operating system now. For example, that's something I've seen in QFile set permissions, which allows you to set file permissions, obviously, on, on files on Windows and POSIX. 
but it decided to implement the POSIX permissions model on Windows. So you can set the readable, writable, executable bits on user group and other on Windows. And you can certainly implement that on Windows because the Windows security model is super, super powerful, but you have not written an interface to the Windows security model, but to a very small subset of it. And the other, mis the other problem that we have seen is that like in the rename example, your cross-platform low-level interface might lose all of the expressiveness, all of the power that your platforms might have just because you have to decide on a common interface to all of those different options and flags, et cetera. So that's uh, the end of my, that's my first chapter. Are there any questions so far? No, Marco. Any questions? Out. No, one question. <laughs> I don't know if you are going to talk it about later, but uh, do we have some guidelines about choosing the right uh, level of abstraction? Uh, I mean, not too low and not too high for uh, an application. Uh, guidelines? No, we debate it a lot. Uh, so that is that is something that is that is hard hard to to generalize, but it 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 means to to think a lot about what it really is that you are you are trying to do here, and I'm thinking uh, I'm thinking about an example that I have. Um, what was it about? Uh, I can't think of something out of the uh, out of the box here, but it really means it really means to think about what it is you're trying to do, like on a on a on a on a on a higher level. What is the problem you're trying to solve, and then you find out. Well, I can go so far with cross-platform C plus plus, and now I have to solve two different two different problems here. Um, but the 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 temporary file problem was, for example, a problem we we really had that we had temporary files and we wanted the uh, we wanted to delete them obviously and not leak them just because we made an error somewhere else and that worked very well on windows because windows had such strong guarantees that they always clean up the file for you and on mac os we didn't quite use it implemented the way i i said here with a database but close close we found out actually what we found out is that we our solution is even simpler we found out that the temporary files that we are creating are files that we only write once and later they're only read and never written again. So we could do something simple and actually put them all in a single temp file where we just always append at the end. And maybe sometimes we have to delete stuff and compact everything. So uh, that simplified our problem very much because now we have a single file we have to clean up. And this was just because Otherwise, we would always leak temporary files. But like that, that shows you the to the level we, we have to think about the problem to actually see. Oh, you're not just creating temp files; you're creating temp files that you only read, only write once and read many times. And maybe there's a better solution. Yeah? Are there, are there questions? Okay. Are there other questions? So no. Okay. No other questions. Okay. Okay, cool. Thanks. I'll keep going. Um, there are other times where you're similar as with files, interacting directly with operating system objects that can behave in, in very different ways on different operating systems. And one such example is, is shared memory. So we use shared memory uh, in our application to implement inter process communication. And I've said initially that our software is an add in to PowerPoint and Excel. And those two have to communicate with each other. But in reality, there are quite a lot of other processes involved. So we have uh, a web ap application that can talk to our PowerPoint add-in. We have um, OAuth authentication processes that allow us to uh, import images from Getty images, maybe. We have a chart scanner that allows you to take a screenshot of a chart. And then we use text recognition and, and image recognition techniques and try to read out the actual data values from the bar chart, maybe, that you only have as an image. 
so that you can copy that data into Excel and, and create a new chart out of it. And we also have a command line process that allows you to cr batch create presentations when you have a template and changing data, maybe monthly reports from some database. Then you can create an entirely new presentation. And our software actually also renders all the charts so they all look pretty. So all these processes have to communicate with each other. And we use the Boost Inter Process API to do so because that offers a common API for shared memory on Windows and POSIX and like Qt does in that, in that example as well. Uh, Boost in the process gives you all the important uh, objects that you, that you need to implement to use shared memory. So the first one is a shared memory object that you can look up by name and map into different processes. Then there is an offset pointer, which is a pointer that you can actually store in shared memory because you, when you have, for example, a vector that you want to put into shared memory, then that can't be a normal vector which actually stores real pointers because that shared memory segment can be mapped at different addresses in your participating processes. So every pointer would be wrong in the other process. Offset pointers solve that problem. They store an offset to themselves. And that is always correct in all the processes. And last but not least, there's a named synchronization object uh, that you can use. So how does that look in code? Uh, a bit like that. So maybe you have a server process that uh, you start and it creates a shared memory segment with a specific name. That name can be very specific to your build version, your host, your security identifier, because it might live in a global namespace. Then you create a shared memory object with that name and a given size, and you can construct an object in that shared memory object. Um, here, just a pair of double and int. And in your child process, you can then look up the shared memory object uh, with the same name, and then you find the object it's just created. So now let's say we have this, these two applications. We run them, we terminate them, and now we start the server again. What happens? Well, surprisingly, this will fail here and with an error message that says a shared memory object of that name already exists. Huh, that's really surprising. We've just terminated the processes. Why does the shared memory object still exist? It's even more surprising if you're coming from Windows, because that means that by default, uh, Boost Inter Process does not use the Windows shared memory implementation. That would look like this. On Windows, shared memory objects are objects that are anonymous file mappings. So they are file mappings that are implicitly backed by the page file and not a specific file. And like we've seen before with temporary files, if you release all the handles to such a file mapping, then that file mapping data will be deleted. If you create a new one, you get new clean data. This is a feature you want. It's a great, great guarantee that you're not reading stale data from some old process run. Uh, but this is not supported on POSIX. POSIX systems work very differently here. And that seems to create a lot of problems because it's very, very hard to use that. So I looked for a solution and all I was finding were other people who had the same problems over 15 years. So on Windows shared memory objects, mutexes, a lot of kernel objects are reference counted. That means when the last handle to them is closed, even if that is because a process has crashed, then that resource is automatically freed. On POSIX, shared memory is either file backed, which means the backing file will still exist if the process crashes, even after a reboot of the system, or you use the actual POSIX shared memory implementation, which is typically pretty limited, uh, which still means that the backing memory will persist until the system is rebooted. So here POSIX assumes that you have a server and a client where the server is responsible for recreating the shared memory object and, and deleting it and recreating it when it is started. If that's not your process model, then there are one and a half uh, solutions that I could find, and Boost in the process nor Qt implemented either of them. So the first solution, or that's what I call half a solution, are the so-called robust pthread mutexes. Uh, a pthread mutex can be marked as shared, which means that you can actually store it in a shared memory object. And then you can mark it as robust, and that means that the pthread mutex will uh, hold bookkeeping data and will keep track of which process last locked it. So if you try to obtain the lock 
and the last owner died, crashed while it held the lock, then pthread mutex lock will return the owner dead and tell you um, this process you're trying to, this, this, this um, resource you're trying to access is in an invalid state because somebody died while it held a lock. So you might have to reinitialize it or just crash yourself or whatever you want to do. So this is only half a solution, of course, because it's not a solution for the case that the other process crashed while it did not hold the lock. You might also want to check that case, but at least it's something. And there is a boost inter process pull request that maybe needs some, some support if you are interested in that. Uh, so I needed another solution because macOS does not even support robust pthread mutexes. And the only resource that I could find on POSIX systems that has process lifetime are file logs. And there's a big warning sign here because file logs on POSIX systems are very weird. Uh, I just found another bug in our code unrelated to this problem here where I had made a mistake with file logs. And there's also a boost in the process pull request by us that tries to improve boost in the process here. So what did we do? What was our solution to that problem? There's a very internal method in that whole inter process uh, architecture. And there's a very internal method that actually creates the backing file. And here's what we do. We try to create the backing file and we try to obtain an exclusive lock when we do so. So when that succeeds, we know that we are the first and the only process that has opened our backing file. And we can just delete the data, as simple as that. And when we have done that, we degrade our lock from an exclusive to a shared lock, and we can go on with our process. When obtaining the initial exclusive lock has failed, then we know we are not the first one here, and we just try to get the shared lock immediately. So this works in practice. It has two problems. So first of all, this F lock call down here is not actually atomic. It does not actually exchange an exclusive lock for a shared lock. It releases an exclusive lock and then tries to obtain a shared lock. So there's something that can happen in between, but luckily uh, I think that is uh, not a problem. So there are only two things that can happen while this F lock call releases the exclusive lock. And the most interesting case is that another process comes along and opens the file with an exclusive lock and thinks he's the first one to do so. But all that happens then is that the file that is already zero size is truncated again, and then they both continue down here. So that doesn't seem to be a problem. And the other, prob the other thing that might happen is that this call by some other process succeeds before that call succeeds. Also not a problem. And then there is another problem, which is probably more interesting, is that file logs also behave very weirdly on network file system shares. All that we require here is that the NFS mount supports local logs. That means the logs we're taking here are visible locally on one machine. Um, but still, that's a requirement that Boost typically does not have, the requirement we introduce, um, that might be a problem for some users. So again, there's our pull request. Um, so what we did here is we were aiming for strong and identical semantics on all the operating systems we support. And that often means that you want to have a solution that offers strong operating system guarantees, because that just makes your life so much easier. And here, what Boost and their process did was that they sacrificed those operating system guarantees just to gain an identical API on both systems. So they had the very different behavior of Windows and POSIX and decided to implement the weaker semantics, the POSIX semantics, on Windows because that was feasible, I would say. And for us, that was not the way to go. We had to go the other way around. We want the operating system to do something useful for us. And here, that meant we actually had to implement that ourselves because both cross-platform toolkits that are popular, Boost and Qt, just went the easy way and said, OK, Here's a shared memory. It behaves completely differently. Do something with it. And that was not, not a good solution for us. All right, are there questions regarding that part? And now we are coming to more one part that is more C++. Yeah, uh, any questions on this? Nobody? No? I don't know if we have questions on, on YouTube. Uh, 
uh, if you have any questions on YouTube, please publish on publish them on the chat. Currently, the chat is just a bunch of uh, greetings, so we don't have any questions on YouTube as well. Alright. Nobody. Ask questions on YouTube if you have some. Yeah. Okay, I think you can go ahead, Sebastian, okay. and okay. we can check later. Yeah. You can check later. All right. Okay. Um, so the next part of my talk is more C++ related. Um, we needed a solution for text translation. So text internationalization is typically much more than just translation. Uh, there are questions about number formats, date formats, etc. But to, here I will just talk about translation. And every translation toolkit, every programming tool, needs to have three important features. You want to be able to annotate the translatable text in your code so that you can easily extract it by some tool and then send the extracted text to translators. That translation might need context so the translators know what you're talking about. And last but not least, your translation toolkit must not make many assumptions about how languages work, because they can be very, very different. When I first uh, held this talk, I learned, for example, that Russian has different plural forms depending on the actual number you're talking about. And uh, German doesn't have that. The general flow, then, if you have such a translation tool, is always the same. You have your annotated source code. You run a tool that extracts all the text that should be translated. You send that to translators. Then you get it back in some XML file in this XML localization interchange file format. And then you have to import it as in your project somehow as a resource. Uh, and then at program runtime, the supporting code can look up the original text, maybe the English text, and return the correct translation considering your currently set UI language. So this is uh, an area where supporting different native mechanisms would be horrible. You want a single markup in your entire code base. You want a single extraction run that finds all the translatable texts. And this one should be platform independent, uh, probably. And then at runtime, you want to have a uniform access mechanisms that always return strings with the same, um, with the same lifetime regardless of uh, where in the code base it is. So you don't want to have cases where sometimes you return in reference counted and a string pointer and sometimes a heap allocated std string. So a single thing is good here. Boost Locale does all of these things that have been added pretty recently. It didn't exist when we first translated our software. Um, so it has a translate function that also serves as the annotation. So you can look for translate and then um, extract the text. Translation supports a context. So if you want to translate open in the context of opening a file to German, then we can do that. And of course, it also supports, for example, different plural forms in different languages. And then in the background, this translate function would do the runtime lookup. It would look up the English text in your uh, text, in your translation database at runtime. But this is 2000. 21 now, we don't have to do runtime text lookups like it's 1995. We have const export functions, and we can do them at compile time. So this is what our code looks like. <clears throat> Let's say we have only two supported languages, English and Russian. And we have a translatable string, which is just an array of all the translations we have, two here in our case. And the translate function would simply pick the right one, taking into account the currently set UI language. Now, then we have to look up that translatable string, and this is this is where a bit of the magic happens. And when we can do that, we can just put it all together and uh, print the correct translated text. So what does the translookup function here, it's for simplicity reasons, a macro, what does that look like? Well, it does a compile time lookup, as I've said. So we have a map of translations, which is this translatable string map. And that takes four unsigned integers as compile time lookup keys. And these are actually hash values. So we, at compile time, calculate the hash of the string that should be translated 
and of the translation context and use these as the keys into our compile time map. So you can probably already guess what is the output at build time of the tool that processes our the XLIF files that contain our translation database. Well, they output template specializations, of course. So our build time translation tool would calculate the same hash we are calculating here in C++, maybe in a Python script, and it would output C++ files full of those template specializations. This gives us one big advantage. Um, so the compile time lookup, maybe it's, maybe it's faster, but that's not so important. Uh, it solves a lot of problems in a cross-platform context because we just don't have to deal with files on the disk. Everything we have here is just a resource that gets compiled into our binary, and it is always there. It might be even be signed, so users can't fiddle with it, but I don't have to worry about users deleting translations or deleting individual files on disk. Uh, this will always work, and in a cross-platform toolkit, I find this to be extremely valuable. Now, what can const extra functions do? By now, they can do pretty much everything. And there have been awesome talks, for example, by Jason Turner at a lot of conferences. So most importantly, const extra functions can only accept and return literal types. Literal types are scalars, references, aggregate types, for example, arrays. You can have your own types as with const extra constructors and destructors as long as all data members and base classes are literal types themselves, and all arrays of literal types are literal types themselves. Uh, context for functions can't be virtual, of course, have to be known at compile time. They cannot contain go to or try catch as of now. I believe the try catch part changes. And very importantly, they can contain if statements, switch statements, all loop statements, and local variables as long as these are initialized. And this makes them extremely powerful. And you can compute a lot of things at compile time. So that makes them easily powerful enough to calculate the hash. So I spare you the code for the hashing. That's straight from GitHub. But you see here the hash function takes uh, an array of characters as a template. It even takes the address of the first character, because that's what the hashing function wants. Also, that works at compile time. So here, we wanted to have strong and identical cross-platform semantics. And that meant uh, to look at our build tools as well and at our build process and sometimes write tools ourselves just so that we can have a single translation tool uh, on both platforms instead of supporting maybe the Xcode one and the Windows one, if there is even a Windows one. Um, yeah, that so solved a lot of problems for us. Now, another tool that we have built regards our error reporting architecture. So we have a very special approach to error reporting uh, that we've also given talks on already. We use a lot of asserts liberally in our code base to check invariance. And what is different in our code compared to others is that those asserts stay in, in release builds. So we ship them to customers, and they will still check for all invariance. And we also check all return values from any system API that we call. And we will distinguish between expected return values and unexpected return values. So if you're creating a file or reading from a file, it is always expected that this file may not longer exist because the user has deleted this. That's uh, an error you always have to handle practically. It's very unexpected that reading from a file would return error out of paper. So that's an error you probably do not want to handle ever. Uh, but maybe you want to know if suddenly read file returns error out of paper, because then you really have a problem. So when we encounter such unexpected behavior, unexpected errors, then maybe we want to show the user an error message. But more importantly, we always send an error report home to our backend. That backend can analyze those error reports. And it can check, for example, if we have already fixed the bug or if we would like more information from the user, and then reports that information back to the process that encountered the error, and which may then decide to download the update that fixes the bug and even install it silently without the user noticing 
So the user will have a new version that will never experience the same problem again. Uh, on our end here, we have a little database application where we can look at the most frequent uh, bugs that are occurring. Uh, we can filter them by build version, by operating system, et cetera. And then we can enter in which build we have fixed the bug. Or if we would ask the user a specific question, do we need a reproduction, maybe input files to get a better handle on the error? So that finds a lot of problems that are specific to the environment of our users. They can have uh, security software installed, DRM software that suddenly changes everything and, and makes our software crash, for example. The core of that entire error reporting architecture is one functional Windows, mini dump write dump, that as the name implies, can write a crash dump of a process. And the smallest crash dump you can write only contains the stack and the thread registers. Uh, and then it will have about 100 kilobyte, maybe. But that already allows you to get uh, the full stack trace of the program in the moment it encountered uh, the bug. Uh, and that can be very, very useful. And that can be enough to, to understand why the problem is happening. So nothing like that existed on macOS. There is a single cross-platform crashing error reporting solution, which is Google Breakpad, which makes a lot of strange decisions, which is why we didn't want to use it. So it decides to write Windows mini dumps on all the systems, which is not a very well supported format. Uh, then you, can, of course, can't analyze Windows dumps on, let's say, macOS, when that, win, when that mini dump contains a macOS crash. So they had to program their own analysis tools as well. So in the end, that was a solution that contained a lot of code, but it wasn't all that powerful, really. And we didn't want to support it in our application. Uh, we could do something else. We found that the binary format on macOS is very well formatted, so the executable format. And that includes a standardized core file format for crash dumps. And all we had to do, really, was to write a core file that only contained stack memory. And we could do this ourselves, really. So what you have to do if you implement your own error reporting handler, your own crash handler, is you have to do that out of process. If your actual application encounters an error, an assert, or an unexpected return value, it is in an undefined state. And you don't know how much it can still do. It might have run out of the stack and can't do anything anymore, really. So you have to send, you have to create a new process and send all access rights to that crash handling process. On macOS, you do that by sending Mach messages, kernel messages. Uh, it's not so interesting. And when you've done that in the crashing process, all you have to do really is go through the documentation of the core file format and through the list of system APIs and assemble all the information you need. You need information on the threads that were running, on the registers they had the moment they were crashing. <clears throat> you get all these. Of course, you have to uh, enumerate all the memory regions of the crashing process. macOS even tells you if that was stack memory. <coughs> Sorry. So you include that in your core file. And then when you have all that information, you put it all together in a single file. And LLDB can just load that file as if it were a system core dump. But now it only has 100 or 200 kilobytes. We attach some metadata that tells us which libraries were loaded in the crashing process, and then we're done. Um, this we have partially open sourced. It doesn't run the way it is, but it contains all the interesting code parts. I think there are some parts missing, like zipping a file or unzipping a file. And then we have well, a backend that we have set up here that receives those macOS crash reports and analyzes them the way we analyze macOS Windows crash dumps. So we have the system binaries for macOS, we have symbols for our own code, and we have a little wrapper for the LDB debugger that loads those core files and initializes all the shared libraries that were loaded. And then we can automatically analyze the bug reports just like we could on Windows. So here again, of course, writing cross-platform software meant that we, we had to improve the tools that we had. And if there's uh, 
a huge gap in one of the operating systems, then we had to fill this ourselves. And now the last part is something uh, completely different, but again, well, we had to build a tool to solve a problem here. We wanted to start building a small web application. So we are always thinking about where Office is going, are people moving to the cloud, et cetera. So we wanted to get some experience writing a web application. So we have a small web application that's part of our product that lets users import charts that they have created in this tableau.com data visualization platform. So the web app is pretty small, maybe a thousand lines of code. But we had to ask ourselves, well, what language do we want to use when we write it? JavaScript was a hard no immediately. And we looked at TypeScript and decided TypeScript looked good. And it's type safe and it has good type definition libraries so you can type safely interface with other JavaScript libraries. And we wrote the first version of TypeScript. But we found out, of course, that sharing code between TypeScript and C++ is now impossible. And there's always some little code you want to share. And we also found out the hard way that the uh, standard library support in JavaScript is very poor. Uh, very few algorithms, the algorithms that exist are pretty bad. Uh, so we didn't really like programming in TypeScript. So we thought about using MScript and then programming our web app in WebAssembly using C++ we're familiar with. Now suddenly we could program in C++, but we couldn't interface with JavaScript anymore safely. Because in MScript, when you make calls to JavaScript, they are not types checked at all, something that TypeScript could do better. So instead, you're passing a lot of strings. So here, maybe we are calling, uh, we're creating a new XML HTTP request, and then we're calling a method on it. And we just have to hope that the open method exists, that it takes those numbers of parameters. There's no way that's going to be checked at compile time. So that was not so great. So we had to build our own little compiler. So TypeScript has those type definition libraries, like I said, and this is what they look like. So they are um, type annotations of JavaScript libraries. Here, for example, for the document element in the standard JavaScript DOM API. And it tells us, well, there is a document class that has the URL property, which is a string, and that is read-only. The active element can be any element on the page, but it can also be null, et cetera, and so on. And there's not only type definition libraries for the built-in standard JavaScript libraries, but there's a large online repository of such type definition libraries for over 7,000 JavaScript libraries, for example, uh, Bootstrap or AngularJS, et cetera. And TypeScript also ships with its own very powerful API that lets us read and analyze those type definition files. So we didn't even have to do that ourselves. You can just instantiate the parser uh, and then iterate over all the source nodes of all the syntax nodes and check, uh, did the user here declare a function? Uh, if it's a function declaration, what's the name of the function? What is the return value of the function? What are its arguments? So we could use the TypeScript API to read such TypeScript interface definitions and translate them into C++ headers. So we can have a type safe interface to JavaScript in C++. So that's exactly what our TypeScript tool does. It's a compiler that creates header files. So you can do type safe and idiomatic C++ programming that is relatively close to the original JavaScript code, but type checked. So where in JavaScript, you would maybe just assign to the title property of the document Instead, in C++, you get the document and call its title center and pass a JavaScript string. So this is roughly what the interfaces look like that we generate. So they are based on the not type safe um, script uh, API. And we generate, uh, sorry, there's no, oh, sorry. We generate a wrapper around that because now we know, well, there's a title property the title property is always a string and it can be set. So we also generate a setup for that property. Um, TypeScript is self-hosting now, actually, I should update the slide. That means it is powerful enough and it understands enough of TypeScript 
that we can already compile the interface definition for the compiler API itself, which we use in our tool. So the original TypeScript code that uh, parses the TypeScript file can now be written in C++, compiled to WebAssembly, and then run in Node, um, and looks very, very similar to the original TypeScript code. There are some interesting, interesting challenges when you're translating one programming language to another one when they're so different. Um, sometimes they're simple, like here in TypeScript, for example, the declaration order does not matter as it does in C++. So this here is valid TypeScript, where I first define uh, the type foobar as the union of foo and bar before those are actually declared. So this would be invalid in C++. So when we are parsing all those types, we're reading all those types, we have to emit them in an order that is valid C++. Um, TypeScript also supports enums that have string or even double values. Uh, that's also not valid in C++, of course. So we have to do another trick. We can customize the marshalling. So they exist in C++ as a simple C++ enumeration. But then there's some compile time lookup map. And we have a map that says, well, in C++, it's funny enum foo. But when you send it to JavaScript, this will be a JavaScript string. And this will be a JavaScript string bar. And last but not least, we can also do function callbacks. So we can write a function in C++ that we can pass as a callback to JavaScript. And then here in that example, when the document is clicked, uh, it will first call a JavaScript function we have created. The JavaScript function will call to the WebAssembly world. And in the end, this will come, uh, this will, this call will arrive in our local callback we have derived, we have, we have uh, written here. So I will skip over the uh, implementation and instead show you the link again. Um, because it's something we're still actively working on. And if you're curious, it's a, it's a very funny uh, project. It's, a, it's a interesting to work on that. And with that, I am, I am done with my overview over the very different challenges we have, we have faced. And now I'm open to more questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I think we can give a big round of applause to Sebastian. I hope. I hope you heard this applause. Because <laughs> the microphone is doing some noise reduction. We have one question. Okay, first of all, we have one question from uh, YouTube. Let me uh, yeah. take it. Okay, it's from Marco Bergam. Another Marco. So it's from another one. Let me take it. Sorry. Uh, okay. Okay, we have this this question, uh, Sebastian, is uh, uh, about testing. Mm -hmm. So Marco is wondering how these low-level differences be between the platforms can be tested. And uh, so if you need to develop different tests for different platforms, or you try to, let's say, unify the, the tests and write only one test working on mm -hmm. all the platforms. That, that's what Marco is uh, is wondering. It's an inter interesting topic, actually. Yeah. Um, well, we well we do write unit. So if we we don't write unit tests for everything, we find that a bit complicated in a, in a desktop software. But we write unit tests for uh, such independent component, like how do we handle files and what's our file abstraction. And these run on every build on macOS and Windows. And I would hope that we write a test for the, well, for the cross-platform behavior that we want to observe. So we, we, we don't test the different operating system behavior that we know. We, we test that the abstraction that we have written behaves uh, the same way on, on, on both platforms. That's how Makes we sense. Yeah, I yeah. understand the so question. So basically only, yeah, yeah. So only one test, let's say, and you run it on different platforms, but the, the test is the same one. The test would be the same, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
to you. As you were saying, for example, with the hash functionality, you want to test that the hash function provides the same result on every platform. Also, that's Apply something that we just um, test because the uh, translation is working. I don't yeah. think <laughs> 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 makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely. Really, yeah. yeah. It wouldn't leak. Uh, no, interestingly, no, interestingly, in that case, good case, because if there was a bug, then it wouldn't link because we are looking for some template specialization that then doesn't exist because the build tool hasn't generated. So if there's a missing translation, we actually get a linker error. Yeah. Also good. Yeah. 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 Okay. Other other questions on on YouTube or here? You're all thinking about the pizza. Don't think about the pizza now. <laughs> think about the pizza later. Questions for us. <laughs> uh, OK, are there questions on YouTube? No, not so far. Uh, or also on Slack. If you have any questions on Slack, I'm also following the Slack channel, but we don't have any. Uh, OK, so just a couple of seconds more, but i don't think we have any other any other questions we have 88 people connected at the moment from from oh. remote and we have eight people here so nice so we are nine here okay other no no questions last last chance no okay you are thinking about the pizza i know <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, Sebastian, thanks a lot for Thank for the talk. Lots of uh, interesting things here, I think, also to, to bring home and to think about. Um, okay, so I think we can we can close the streaming right now and uh, let me just uh, remove these uh, uh, slides so we can Okay, we, we can say goodbye to Sebastian. And okay, thanks a lot again, Sebastian. Thank you. And uh, for, for all the other people connected, see you next time for the meetup, the last meetup before Christmas, and then fingers crossed for next year, because I hope that, you know, the numbers won't increase, the emergency number won't increase, and we can keep on doing these uh, hybrid meetups at the beginning of next year as well. So thanks a lot for coming, all the people Thank here and me. the people online. Thanks, Sebastian, for, for attending for, for the session. And uh, uh, see you next time. Cheers. See you next time in life. See you maybe. next time. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. Maybe in person, yeah. Maybe Cheers. in person, yeah. Ciao, ciao. Cheers. Ciao.